welcome to Face to Facts. I am Nick Face, and we wish you a wonderful holiday season. To our right this evening, we have a couple guests that have been on Face to Facts from before. Uh, we have Ryan Sullivan, Bag in the House. Andres, please remember, please remind everybody your last name. Bag there. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Sorry about that. Welcome, you guys, back to Face to Facts. We've got an exciting show here because we've got a lot of great things happening in pretty much all four sports. Yeah. We have baseball having a lot of exciting things going on. Football wrapping up their season, about to get ready for uh, the playoffs. Then we also have the Celtics and the Bruins also in, in uh, full action right now. So let's get to it. Let's get to the, 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 uh, the board. First thing we want to look at is Major League Baseball. And right now it's an exciting time for baseball fans, specifically if you're a Red Sox fan, because Christmas has come early. Yes, it has. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner was served early this week by the Boston Red Sox. And we're going to first go over the first new addition to the Red Sox bullpen. That is Tyler Thornsburg, traded uh, on Tuesday, as a matter of fact, to the uh, from the Milwaukee Brewers. We parted with Travis Shaw and a couple mm -hmm. minor leaguers. Let's open up with Andres. Overall thoughts on this move by the Red Sox? Um, honestly, it was probably a good pickup because our bullpen did look a little um, shaky towards the end of the year. So I think it was a good pickup, and we needed you know a good middle relief guy to the seventh, eighth, ninth inning mm -hmm. that can give us some innings and shut him down. What do you think of him? Well, yeah, I mean the that the relievers were probably our biggest you know, problem last year. And I think bringing in a new reliever is never going to be a bad thing. I think that's definitely, we need the help. What the Red Sox had a lot of problems with last season was health. Yeah. Koji Uehara was a year older. He was in and out of the disabled list a few times during the season. Janichi Tozawa was a shell of himself. You have to deal with that. And then you had Craig Kimbrell also being out from a torn meniscus that was right around the All-Star break. You need consistent arms that are in your bullpen to solidify any game that's close. If it's 3-2, to two, you can hand that ball off to somebody and not have to hold your breath. And say, oh my God, I hope that they can hold the yeah. lead. You have a quality arm here who was, as a matter of fact, a failed starter by Milwaukee. They threw him into the bullpen um, a couple years back. Um, last season, he had a phenomenal year. Mm -hmm. Was able to step in. Uh, and, and actually be that gap between the eighth and even sometimes in the ninth. Um, he was averaging quite a high amount of strikeouts, so his strikeout rate was excellent. I have a fear, though, with, with this move, and I hope it's not the same as Carson Smith. The injury. He's already been having a couple different arm issues in years past. Is that something that's legitimate that we should be concerned about? I, I don't think it's, I mean, I don't think he's one of our top relievers. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we got a guy, we got great depth there. So I think we get a few injuries. I think we can, we can still pull through with it. Even without Smith. Now, Smith doesn't return until uh, about June, May, June. Smith was supposed to be the catalyst of that bullpen last year. Yeah. He was supposed to be the guy that got you to Kimbrel and not have to worry about a thing. Tommy John surgery comes, you lose Carson Smith for the year, basically. The Red Sox can't go through that again. You're already parting with a couple guys that have been there, done that, with Koji and Tozawa and even Brad Ziegler, to throw him into the mix there. You can't go about an injury like this. Yeah, you know what, I totally agree, because I don't think Boston's going to go look for Koji Uhara again. Mm -hmm. He's how old? He's like 43? Yeah, Koji's getting yeah, up there like, in an age. And it, like... Chinichi Tozawa, he just hasn't been consistent for me. And Brad Ziegler, same thing. He's getting older. Like, I personally cannot trust those guys. Mm -hmm. And if he goes out and he's having arm problems, it's going to be a big loss for us. I think the only guy on that list who I might consider rejoining the pen, it wouldn't really probably happen because it's just not going to match up with the arms yet, was Ziegler. I didn't mind Ziegler. Ziegler seemed like if he was in the specific role he was, did a fairly decent job. Yeah. He could strike guys out when needed. John Farrell, on the other hand, and we're going to get to the John Farrell side of things in, in a moment as well, but he didn't. I don't think he managed um, Brad Ziegler very, very good during the season. He put him in wrong situations. He wouldn't allow him to face a left-handed batter. Here's a guy that was the closer for the Diamondbacks. 
Yes, the Diamondbacks didn't have such a great season, but he was still trusted to take over the, the ninth inning and did a very good job at doing so. Any other things that we should look for with uh, Mr. Thornsburg? Welcome to Boston, right? Yeah, Welcome much. to Boston. Now, that wasn't the big move. Usually breakfast is the light meal, right? That was a, like almost like an appetizer. <laughs> uh, yes. This is your Christmas dinner came next. That was Chris Sale. This came out of nowhere. Yeah. Usually I follow along with MLB trade rumors or some other things that there's a little bit of buzz in the atmosphere that's you kind of can expect certain things. Monday night when I went to bed, it was all nationals that were supposed to be getting Chris Sale. Did you hear the same? Yeah. Yeah. Tuesday, finishing off a meeting, turn the radio on, breaking news, Chris Sale is a Red Sox. I'm like, no, he's not. Like, stop. This is a joke. Sure enough, Chris Sale is a Red Sox. I just want to hear your thoughts on this move. Let's I, start with uh, Ryan first. I'm, I'm so surprised. I'm so happy. I mean, we got Price last year, and that was a, a huge deal. And then the next year we get Sale. I think if, if Price can get back to – you know, the way he played a few years ago. I mean, Sale has been one of the most consistent, dominant pitchers over the last, like, six years. And he is going to be – he is the huge addition that the Red Sox Here's a question for you. Is he your opening day starter? I think he is. I don't okay. think there's anyone on that rotation better. What are your opinions? Um, honestly, like, look at our top three. It's Price, Porcello, and Sale. Yeah. Like, those three starters could be – in any other American League team, could be their number one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Our pitching rotation, or at least our top three, is pretty much untouchable. Mm -hmm. And I think Chris Sale will open up the year, and then Porcello, and then Price. I think that's what's going to Imagine happen. starting David Price as your number three <laughs> I know, starter. Yeah, I mean, I'm laughing about it because it's kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, yeah, number-wise, he does. He does deserve to be your number three. He did not have a good year, and some people think, oh, it wasn't that bad, like Dumbo the Elephant, John Farrell. <laughs> oh, it wasn't that bad. He actually pitched. No, <laughs> he pitched terrible. Okay, Farrell? Chris Sale being your ace is exactly what I'll, I pretty much I said off air. I, I wanted Chris Sale for five years. I wanted it for five years. And here's a move that technically could have happened at the All-Star break at this point from the 2016 season. Let's give credit where credit's due here. Dave Dombrowski, who was the general manager and, and uh, president of baseball operations, waited and waited and waited for the right move and the right time to go and get Chris Sale. And lo and behold, he was able to do that. The All-Star break, the Chicago White Sox are looking for a package that had anything from Mookie Betts, Xander Bogarts, Jackie Bradley, Andrew Benintendi. Boy, have the times changed, haven't they? <laughs> I'll part with Juan Mancata. I'll part with Michael Kopik, And I'll part with the other two prospects that were able to get us Chris Sale. Hands down, this is one of, could be one of the best moves that Dave Dombrowski has possibly made in his baseball career. Overall thoughts on Dave Dombrowski? Yeah, I think it was, I think it was a really good, solid move, I think. We need stars. I think, you know, at this point, we're a young, really talented team. I think we have to go for the home run. We got to get, you know, these next few years. We need a World Series since we, we got those players around them. Oh, my God. Totally agree. I mean, yeah, like, look at all the Cuban baseball players that come out. Like, I haven't seen much projection except for um, – First baseman for the White Sox. Um, That's Jose Abreu. Yeah, Jose you can Abreu, even say yeah. um, maybe a, Cespedes, a Cuban player. Oh, yeah. 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 And can we go to that point just for a second on the Cuban side of things yeah. for baseball? People don't understand. Maybe it's how they draft players, they scout players. The Cuban way of baseball, it's a completely different game. Yeah. Completely. We've seen a lot of players typically not been able to pan out here when they come to the usually the United States to play baseball. And number one I can think of for the, on the Red Sox list is uh, Rosny Castillo. Yeah. What a bust that was. Um, another player that, another way that you can also look at is usually if players come from Japan, usually that also doesn't pan out that well. Couple exceptions, Ichiro Suzuki, um, who's the guy, Tanaka, Tanaka for the Yankees. But that's something that is also very risky. It's risky business. You need to go out and get 
people that are going to get the job done. So to the Juan Mancata front, could he be a good player? They say he could. But I think that that's, it's too much of a risk to say, I think he's going to be something. Yeah. When you have the chance of getting somebody who's proven, got the job done, many, many seasons, and you can go and get him to your, anchor your rotation, I think, the, I think the move was brilliant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, it, I think it was a great move. I mean, Sale, again, is so consistent. And I think, you know, Juan Makata is, he, I, I totally agree with that. You know, he could be a stud or he could not. But Sale is incredibly consistent. I mean, there's not many pitchers that can go out there every season and produce elite numbers, and Sale can. I think, hands down, Chris Sale is the best American League pitcher that there is. You could probably debate... Uh, Corey Kluber from the Indians. You could probably debate uh, Tanaka from the Yankees. You could debate uh, David Price if he's right. American League-wise, if you put the numbers together, Chris Sale is, is the ace. Maybe Verlander if healthy, too. Yeah. But overall, I mean, that, that's, that's the epitome of what an ace is. So bringing him in, I think this is the best trade for a pitcher that the Red Sox have done since Pedro Martinez and Kurt Schilling. Yeah. I think that th this, is, this is your Pedro or Schilling that could take you over the top to win not just a couple World, not just one World Series, but potentially a couple. Um, the other player uh, I wanted to just mention quickly was Michael Kopech, who the Red Sox parted with. The reason why they parted with Kopech is Jason Groom got drafted from the Red Sox this 2016 season. He was a top pick. So Jason Groom kind of overtook Michael Kopech. I'm sure you guys have no clue about who Michael Kopech is. <laughs> that is fine. That's why you're laughing, and I knew that. That's why. I don't mind getting a chance to talk about it. He's a nuthead. So he can go to the White Sox. Um, he was suspended at the early part of this season because oh, he, he hit a teammate. So he can take his fun and games attitude and just go. Uh, he can kind of replace Chris Sale cutting up unis and everything <laughs> there. Now, I'm glad I got to that point, too, because should we be concerned about Chris Sale's demeanor, his behavior. Is that something that should be of a concern for the Red Sox? I don't think it is. And I mean, again, I, you know, I hear it a lot about with the case of Dwight Howard and the Celtics, like, you know, locker room problems. I don't, I, you know, you're out there and you play the game. I mean, if it, if it's like a huge issue and he's got temper tantrums out there, I mean, that's a different yeah, story. Throw him in a corner and give him a book or something. <laughs> I think he's, I think it's fine. Okay. What do you think? Um, honestly, like, I don't think it's a big deal. I think that the reason why he was acting out like that is because the White Sox like are just not a good team. Like no. they have nothing going for them. Yeah. Honestly, like I see why Chris Sale did act up because was it a way for him to get out of there? You know what? Like yes, I do because like I kind of thought the same. Doesn't like Chicago whatsoever. Do you remember the story back around spring training of this past year when Adam LaRoche was a player for the White Sox, and his son was always inside the clubhouse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Chris Sale flipped out because this little, you know, this geeky dude from the top in the White Sox organization <laughs> comes down, you're not allowed to have him in the clubhouse anymore. And Chris Sale was like, get the heck out of here and go back upstairs. Like, I'm listening to you. So Adam LaRoche ended up retiring and just said, yeah. you know, if you're not going to have my son here, then I'm not going to play. So goodbye. I think at that stage, it kind of set Chris off, Chris Sale off and just said, why should I stand by an organization that's doing this when this, this kid was nothing but awesome to be a part of this team? It's like their mascot, their rally guy in a way. It just triggered a series of events in Chris Sale's season that obviously led to the uh, wonderful uniform debate. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what happened was the unis that they were supposed to wear uh, they were throwback style, and Chris Sale just decided that he didn't want to wear them, so he just took matters into his own hands and just went around with the scissors and cut them up. <laughs> I think there was a better way of going about it, um, but that got me to think, what if Chris Sale doesn't like the Friday blues and, blues and reds that the Red Sox end up playing with? Like, should we hide the scissors? <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Hopefully. I don't think we should worry about it either. <clears throat> So I'm very excited with uh, Chris Sale. I mean, another great thing for yeah. you stat fans out there. 
Last season, when he was up against the AL East, he was 6-0 and with a 155 earned run average. Yeah, All I saw that, that is just lovely. That's... I love it. In his career against the Yankees, he is 6-0 and with a 1.17 <laughs> ERA. Did you guys Ooh. happen to see what uh, Brian Cashman said last night no, about uh, the Chris Sale thing? He said it's just like how Golden State was able to go out and get Kevin Durant. Yeah. Oh, I think I did. What do you think of that? Um... Like, I agree with that. Like, look, he was like the Kevin Durant of, yeah. like, the American League. Yeah. So, honestly, for us to get him, we're like the Golden State Warriors of baseball. Yeah. As you could say. Like, we're. See, I would have been okay if a team like the Royals, the Indians, the Orioles, one of, one of those teams said it. But because the, the Yankees, Yankees said it, yeah. the Yankees need to shut up. Yeah. Okay. They got 27 rings. Like, <laughs> relax. Now it's the Red Sox chance to. You know, no pun intended, stick the finger right at them. <laughs> Look what we have. We got more rings. Um, so I'm just, when, when he said it, I kind of was like, you know what? Shut up. Yeah, I know. Just go away. You're just mad you didn't get them. <laughs> so, well, they hate us because they ain't us. That's the other thing, too. <laughs> there we go. Um, thoughts. Uh, and then the next, the next move that came for dessert. Remember, we have breakfast. We have our lunch portion, which is kind of like the big Christmas dinner. Yes. Christmas lunch, in a way. Um, your apple pie was Mitch Moreland. So Mitch Moreland was the gold glove winning first baseman from the Texas Rangers. Signed him for a one-year, $5 million deal. Because, again, what I love about Dave Dombrowski is he's a straight shooter. He's going to tell fans and players and teams exactly what he wants to do. And he did not want to sign somebody long-term for the first base DH spot, which we can debate about as well in a second. But signing Mitch Moreland for a short tour, shirt a short-term deal, I think is a great move. It gives your defense a great quality guy over there. Has the potential to actually be a pretty good player. Mitch Mullen hit 22 home runs last year, 60 RBIs, 240 average. It's a little bit low. I think putting him in Fenway Park with the wall will make him a better quality hitter. Thoughts on Moreland? Well, I don't think it can hurt us. I mean, a short-term deal, I mean, if he's a bust, then we get rid of him, you yeah. know, and... I don't think the expectations for him coming in here is huge. We have a lot of different number of bats, so he's not going to have much pressure. I think he'll, mm -hmm. I think he'll do all right. Um, honestly, this is kind of bold, but I think he's going to hit 30 home runs oh boy. and have 100 RBIs. Oh, boy. So Christmas coming early for Andres. Okay. <laughs> give, me, give me it. Why? You know what? Like that you know, porch out in left field, the green monster, I'm feeling yeah. like he's going to have some power going Go in that direction. If he can use the field effectively, yep. go, go with his swing, I think that he could do something really nice there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now, the debate. Mitch Moreland is kind of that short-term, low-risk, low high-reward type of guy. David Ortiz is no longer a Red Sox. It's going to be very difficult to replace 40 home runs, 120, 300 average. Yeah. Mitch Moreland is a decent piece. That's not David Ortiz. No. Now, the question here is, could they have gone out and got somebody better? Or can they still go out and get somebody better? A couple different options there. What do you think? I think at this point, I, think it's, I don't think the Red Sox are going to go out and get like a superstar. I think Edwin probably, Edwin Encarnacion probably would have been that David Ortiz like type. Like him under my Christmas tree. Yeah, but <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think there's, I don't think they're going to go out and get anyone at this point. Um... I kind of agree with Ryan. Like, yeah, it'd be nice to get like a Jose Batista or an Edwin, but like, yeah. our off season we did well. Like, we got top pitcher, mm -hmm. solid bat, yep. and a relief pitcher, which we needed bad. That was like our main concerns, right there. So I think we did good. Well, if you think about how the Red Sox kind of operated last year, they were very offensive driven, weren't they? Yeah. Pitching wise, yeah. Porcello kind of caught lightning in a bottle and just delivered a Cy Young season. Outside of Porcello, boy, was it shaky, wasn't it? Yeah. So it's going to be kind of a reverse or a little bit of a shift next season if the emphasis is now strictly driven on pitching. With Chris uh, Sale being inserted into that rotation, you're kind of getting away from the, the thump, that thunder in your lineup with the Ortiz and saying, all right, you know what, maybe we're going to win defensively pitching the ball, having a good bullpen, and our offense will take care of itself. Do you think that could be the approach? Um, no. You still think offense is the approach? Yeah. Okay. Like, look, look at the young bats we have. 
like our top five is just solid. Mm -hmm. Like Bogarts, Betts, Bradley, Pedroia, Hanley. Like Hanley had what thirty home runs and a yep. hundred RBIs and like a two eighty average. Yep. Mookie had an MVP type season. Yep. I think offense is the main thing. Mm -hmm. And yes, our pitching is gonna be. I'd say right now, top three in the whole league. What still needs to be done? If you look at the roster right now, we have a surplus of starting pitching and arms that could be used in the pen. We have some questionable spots that are still across the infield and outfield. Catching, maybe there's an adjustment to be made. You may still need that DH-style uh, player. What do you think has to be done? Yeah, I think the DH, I think that is going to hurt us the biggest. I mean, Poppy is more than just a 40 home run, over 100 RBIs guy. I mean, he is, he's clutch. He, he does everything. He is, he was, he's the face of our franchise. And, I mean, a few years ago, I think when we beat the Cardinals, I mean, he had that huge playoffs. I mean, he's just that guy for us. Mm -hmm. And I think, who is it? Hanley is going to be our DH? I, I think that's a big hole for us. I think... Hanley's going to suffer a little bit without Ortiz here. David Ortiz kept him in check a r very good amount of the time this during this season. Yeah. Hanley, in a way, kind of needs that babysitter. Yeah. And without the babysitter there, <laughs> he's just going to run crazy, and I don't know who's going to keep him in check, but we'll have to see. Do you have a different side of things? Yes. Okay. Um, you always I, do. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a new catcher. Yeah? Like, okay. I don't trust Sandy Leone. Okay. Like... What about Swihart? No. What about Vasquez? No. No? Nope. What, what do they do? I think you go out and you go for... Oh, wait wait a minute. Buster Posey. No, no, oh, not, not okay. bad. I was just going to start. All right, all right, all right. Uh, like someone like Salvador Perez. All okay. right. I like him. Older guy. Gets the job done. Would He's the Royals part with him? Honestly, I think they should start rebuilding. Royals? Yes. Okay. Honestly, didn't they just get rid of like their best closer? Wade Davis yes. is going to the Cubs, I think that's what I've yeah. been hearing. Yeah. So, so yes, they are trying to unload. Yeah, so um, I mean we give away a couple guys, like a couple bullpen guys. They need now. Yeah. They just got rid of, rid of uh, Wade Davis. Yep. We get Salvador Perez, we will have the best lineup in baseball and one of the best pitching staffs in baseball. Okay. That's an interesting point. Um, a couple things that I would like to look at on the list. Um, see, you're high on Moreland. I'm not. I like Moreland as a defensive replacement. I want somebody better that's in that lineup as the DH. I want to leave Hanley at first. I want to leave him there. Hanley did great at first base last year. Could have very well put up a gold glove if it wasn't for Moreland. You need that production. Without Ortiz's bat there, where are you going to get it from? I think putting a lot into the whole Mitch Moreland thing is, is risky. And I don't think that Dombrowski and the Red Sox are sitting around here waiting for the risk anymore. They're going to go for that slam dunk home run. That's why there's so many players right now they have starting pitching-wise and on this roster where you can think and say, you know what, maybe there is a move that still has to be made. The move that I'm really big on is Victor Martinez. I really like the bat over with the, with the uh, Tigers. He's a little bit older, of course, about 37 years old. He's been here before as a Red Sox. He knows how to hit. He's a switch hitter who can hit with authority. Okay, That would be a bat that I would look as your David Ortiz-style replacement, and I think that that would really solidify the lineup there. You can look at Jose Batista. I don't like that swing right now. He's older. I think that he is a swing-and-miss style guy. That's Mike Napoli, basically. Um, there's another name. I do not want Mike Napoli around this team. He's been here before. He's done that. It's time to move on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Napoli only hit 239 last year. Yes, he had over 30 home runs, 100 RBI. I'm not a big swing and miss style guy. Put the ball in play. Now for the Patriots. Okay. We're very close towards the end of the season, and it's been another successful one for the Patriots. I believe their record's 10 and 2 right now. Yep. Am I correct yep. on that? The next opponent for the Patriots will be the Baltimore Ravens. It will be a Monday night game. So that will be uh, December 12th. That will be at, I believe, Gillette Stadium as well. My overall question here is, what do we think about this upcoming game? Let's lead off with Andres. Um, 
I'm not too nervous at all. I think Tom Brady is just too much of a competitor. Like, yeah, the run defense is like a top three in the league, but I don't think that's going to stop Brady at all. Like, he just found a new target, Malcolm Mitchell. He's been such a big asset Love to the team. Love that player. Yeah. Honestly, like, yeah, we all thought Martellus Bennett was going to be, like, a huge factor. Yeah, he's going to be down the road because Gronk's over the year. Yeah. But I know we might they might stop the run game, but they're not going to be able to stop the high-powered offense of Tom Brady and his weapons. Malcolm Mitchell is the receiver that they've always wanted since Randy Moss. Yep. Not a bold statement, but the Patriots are getting that production from Malcolm Mitchell right now. How about your thoughts? I think this game is going to be a showdown. I, I don't think it's going to be an easy win for the Pats. The Ravens always play us very tight. And Joe Flacco, what, he threw for like 350 yards and like four touchdowns last week. Ravens are playing real well lately. They always play us tight. Their defense has been huge this year. It's going to come down to, like, a last drive scenario. All right, so that's one point for you. I don't know yet. What do you think I'm going with? Blowout. I'm right on your, I'm right on your side. The <laughs> Ravens have always played the Patriots tough. Always. Here's a matchup where... The Patriots and Ravens, just so we know, they hate each other. This is like blood because <laughs> this is where the whole Tom Brady deflate gate nonsense started. This is the first chance on really getting to play the Ravens since then. I think the Patriots want to shove it up there, you know what, yeah. and make this a 40, 50 point game and tell John Harbaugh and his crew to pack your bags and go back to Baltimore style game. <laughs> So, yes, I do think it's going to be a tight one because the Patriots do have some players that are out. But I would love to see Andre's point in just complete smack in the mouth. Okay? This is how the Colts got into it is because of the Ravens. They tipped them off. Harbaugh was all upset because Julian Edelman, if you remember, was able to throw the touchdown pass to Danny Amendola yep. in that playoff, and that just set Harbaugh off. So... I am expecting this to be a close game, something in like the 24-21 you know, situation yeah. right there. I do think because this game's at Gillette, it will be an advantage for the Patriots. Um, but the schedule ahead, I'm just looking at it right here. It goes the Ravens, and then it goes Denver in mile high. Then it goes Jets Christmas Eve Saturday. And then you finish your season off with a team that's been one of my biggest surprises of this season, that's Miami. And they're going to Miami. So my overall opinion here is Patriots got to be careful with themselves. They got to stay healthy. But I think they also need to realize that there's no packing it in like they did last season. That killed them. If that game against Denver was at Gillette, I think they would have won. Yeah. So they don't want to have to travel again and have to face the same deck of cards that they had last off season. Let's go down the top. We'll start with Andres. What are your thoughts on the rest of the season? Um, you know what? Yeah, I think the Denver game is going to be tough. But honestly, if we beat Denver, Denver might not even get into the playoffs. That's true. Like I would love that. That would be huge for us. Um, the Dolphins, I'm not nervous about. I'm going to be dead honest with you because I just don't think they're that good. Okay. I don't think Ryan Tannehill is good at all. I think we'll be able to shut down Jarvis Landry and Devontae Parker. They, I mean, Jai, what about him? Our run defense has been playing phenomenal. That's a point for you. I think the run defense is a major strength for the Patriots. Yeah. What do you think? Well, who, I think again. I think I think we'll do fine against the Broncos. I don't think they're the team that they were last year. I mean, they're they've been losing a lot. Of, I mean, they lost yeah. to the Chargers. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with quarterback play. Yeah, Travis Simeon is just. Terrible. They, Here's another Joe Schmo off the street. <laughs> yeah, their, their offense has taken a big downward spiral. I mean, and their run game, I mean, which was a big strength for them last year, it's been horrible this year. I think Dolphins will be a good game. I think we'll sneak it out. Who else do we face? Uh, the Jets. That's going to be another good game. They always play us tight. Uh, is that was that it? The, uh, yep, and then just yeah, the Ravens one. I think out of them all, I'm looking at the Ravens game to be the one that's yeah. the uh, the dice yeah, roller. I, I could flip a card and say win, lose. 
Yeah. Just because of the history. The history is what sets this apart. If this didn't have any history, if this was like a, a Tennessee Titan style yeah. thing, they have no history. Um, <laughs> it's, it's no offense, Tennessee. Tennessee <laughs> just just using you as an example. We'll use the Rams as an example because that's a laughing stock of football Fisher. right now. Jeff Fisher is the best coach in the NFL. <laughs> um, but I just think overall, looking at the schedule, it's going to be tough. But I think the Patriots could succeed and be able to go into the playoffs on a high note. And that's what needs to be done. Now, looking around the rest of the league, there are obviously some teams that, if you're the New England Patriots, you would prefer not to play. So let's talk about some of those matchups that we could potentially see if when the Patriots hit the playoffs. <laughs> you got a big smirk over from Andre, so uh, over there. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, this is kind of surprising. I'm not even scared about the Oakland Raiders. Oh, boy. You know what? Why not? Look at, uh, who did they just face this week? The oh Carolina my... Panthers, wasn't it? No. Um... Oakland Raiders. Who did the Oakland Raiders play this week? They were down. Say it again. Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo. that was you. it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Words from above. I appreciate it. <laughs> it was Buffalo. And they were down, what, like 24 to something? Yep. And a half. Yeah, I know. Derek Hart caught, you know, some fire. But, like, if they go down that much against New England, there's no coming back. Like, I'm going to be dead honest. Okay. Like, their defense is good. Like, Khalil Mack, he's a monster. Yeah. I mean, if we can block Khalil Mack and get him out of the game, I think the Patriots will do very well against the Raiders. I want that game at Gillette, though. Um, yes. Yeah. I want that game yeah. at Gillette. I think I think it'll be a pretty good game. I think we're pretty similar teams. I think we both. I mean, we both have really good offenses. I think if we can, I think Khalil Mack is going to be the biggest problem, though, yeah. and because we faced the Broncos, you know, last year in that championship game. And Vaughn Miller was all over Brady, and we couldn't do anything. So oh, yes. if Khalil Mack Hit is him up and spit him out, <laughs> if, if Khalil Mack is coming really hot in that game and does really well, I think Brady's gonna have some trouble. I think that Patriots can get past Oakland. I do. I think that if you look at any of the teams that are in the AFC, I'm not particularly concerned with really. Anybody. I think the Patriots are okay over there. Now my concern, and you know who I'm going to say. Oh, my God. The Dallas Cowboys. America's team. America's team. Jerry Jones, here he comes. He'll pay somebody <laughs> off so they can win. Um, are we jumping the gun here a little bit? Could it possibly be Dallas and New England in the Super Bowl? Nope. I think it could definitely be Dallas and the Patriots. I think... Okay. If it's not Dallas, you, you'll have, excuse me. You'll have your turn in a minute. Let him speak. <laughs> if it's not the Cowboys, it'd be the Seahawks. But the Cowboys, they're the closest team to the Pats right now. And I think, you know, I'm of course a huge Patriots fan, but Cowboys have had the best year this yep. year out of all the teams. Their offense. I mean, how are we going to stop Ezekiel Elliott? We can't. Prescott has been on a roll, and their defense has been underrated. I, they are. I mean, they're what are they the most? I think they're they've only got one loss. One loss. I think they're eleven and one. Yep. And they're for yeah. real. They're definitely. They're, definitely they're the legit. most put together team. I think that includes your offense, your defense. Look at this smirk on him. Can you hit him? <laughs> <laughs> uh, special teams, kicking, all, all that. I think yeah. they have the total package. They're a better team than Patriots, my opinion. I think so. No. Okay. No, uh, I'm gonna be honest. I think it's gonna be the Seahawks and the Patriots. Ooh, um, okay. Look, they just got Thomas Rawls back, and he just had a monster game. Uh, Russell Wilson's finally healthy, and he's been playing very well. They just beat the Panthers, what, like 45 to like like 12 or something? It was a blowout. Um, I think the Legion of Boom is just too strong. Like, I mean, I know Earl Thomas is out, but like their defense... Don't smile at that. I'm that, not. That move right there... Is the crushing blow, I think, to Seattle. I don't know. That's I just... huge. That's huge. That's huge. Patriots can expose that so much. Kind of karma also hits them, too, because early, because uh, yeah, Thomas was, was the one that yeah. nailed yeah. Gronk. So, deja vu. Yeah, I don't know. I think that the Seahawks, if it is the Seahawks and the um, Cowboys for the NFC Championship, I think it'll be the Seahawks because they have more experience in the playoffs. Like, Dak Prescott's a rookie. Like, yeah, he's been good, but like 
So let me let me ask you this question. If you got a chance to choose who you'd like to play in the in, in the Super Bowl, I'll ask the both of you this question. Who would you want the Patriots to face and why? Let's go. I mean Cowboys. All right. I know I just said the Seahawks will beat the all Cowboys, right. but I think the Cowboys are a weaker team. Wow. All right. Wow. I just think Dak Prescott, if he does get to the I Super Bowl. I love having a difference of opinion. No, that's great. I'm fascinated by it. He'll choke. I'll call now. He will choke. I could see that like, because I think he is. Don't get me wrong. Dak's been a winner. Yeah. But he has been overrated. A lot of people are, oh, Dak Prescott is the next Tom Brady. Now, he's got a long way to go. Let's just make sure that we get that point out. He's got a long way to go. But he is winning, and that's why Tony Romo was not seeing any field time. What do you think? I, I think they're both great teams, but I'm going to have to agree with Andres. I might rather face the Cowboys because the Seahawks, if we hit them in the Super Bowl, they're going to want their revenge. And Russell Wilson, he is so clutch. I, I think we could expose the Cowboys' defense. I think the Seahawks have a much better defense. And um, I think Even we could... Even without Earl Thomas, huh? Yeah, I think... Okay. I think Prescott in a Big Super no Bowl, Sherman. that'd be a lot of pressure. You know, underrated player, Deshaun Shedd, yeah. cornerback. He's a monster for the Seahawks. Richard Sherman accounts for three additional people with the size of his nose on the football <laughs> yeah. field. So, um, I personally would also rather Dallas. I don't want Seattle. Pete Carroll already came in New England and was able to beat the Patriots. Granted, Brady should have... Yeah. Been able to get that touchdown to at least tie the game. I get that. Um, I don't want any business with Seattle. And you're exactly right. I don't want them thinking they need a revenge. We need Seattle out, uh, just out yeah. completely. Because that's one team that I think could get hot real quick and just ride on into the Super Bowl. Yep. That's what I think there. Um, let's look at, we looked at the team side of things. Um, are we all pretty confident in saying that we think the Patriots can get to the Super Bowl? Even yeah. with the team they have and the injuries? Yeah. That's without Gronk. You think it still can be done? Yes. Yeah, we got big it says Marty. a lot about Tom Brady, doesn't it? It really does. He's, he's the and goat. Edelman and everything. Of course he is. No one better. Let's look at some top players here in the, in the, NF, in the NFL because the MVP is going to be coming. There's some players that may fall under the radar a little bit that need some name recognition and need some airtime. So I want to think about who, are, who the, are top players that deserve some sort of a recognition right now. What do you think? Uh, let's see. Mm, I'd probably say Matt Ryan. I think he's a little – I think he, he was really big in the beginning of the year. Maybe he's gotten a little under the radar. So I think he could be, he could be up there in the MVP conversation. How is Atlanta doing to get to the playoff? I think that's what matters. Yeah. I think they're – Are they close? I think, it's gonna be, I think it's going to be them and the Bucs fighting for okay. it. I'm going to say David Johnson. Great, great Ooh. selection. I like that. All right. Like, he's been – I mean, the Cardinals have, like, what, like four wins? Yeah. But, like, those four wins have become, like, the David Johnson show. Yeah. Like, last year it was, like, Carson Palmer to Larry Fitz, like, stuff like that. But, like, Carson Palmer hasn't done well at all. No. It's been David Johnson. Like, yo, team, jump on my back. Let's go. We're going to win this game. He like, scored in every game, right? Got a touchdown? Yeah. This week yeah. he had, like – 80 yards rushing, 90 yards receiving, and two touchdowns. Yep. He's a monster. Um, I think comeback player of the year this year would be DeMarco Murray. Easily. The numbers that he put up, here's a guy that was kind of forgotten with the Philadelphia Eagles and got traded. Yeah. Tells you right there that Chip Kelly is a pathetic football coach. <laughs> yeah. Pathetic. He can't say, he can't, to not have DeMarco Murray be outstanding with the Philadelphia Eagles system is the most absurd thing that I think I've ever seen. He's very talented, DeMarco Murray. So I was very pleased to see him come back to life with the Titans right there. Um, I love the selection of David Johnson. Um, I'm going to be different because you kind of stole mine. <laughs> so I'm going to go out on a limb and say Ezekiel Elliott. I think we have to talk about that. I mean, his numbers that he's put up for a rookie have been mind-boggling. Yeah. Um, he could very well be in the consideration for MVP. Rookie of the year, I think, is a slam dunk um, outside of Dak. I think Ezekiel's numbers are better. Now, the problem here, and this is one of the things that 
it's hard to teach for people on who to follow as a player. I would never tell a young kid or anything to go idolize Ezekiel Elliott. He's not a good guy. He's a bad dude. So the way he portrays himself is not the best way. But number-wise, yes, he is statistically probably going to be that rookie of the year and could very well be that MVP. We also cannot not mention Tom Brady. Tom Brady has to be in that conversation as well. Came back after his four-game suspension, and there's been no looking back. I mean, he's been having his one of his best seasons he's had. And again, he's going to be doing this without Gronkowski, so you have to put that into the equation there when you mm -hmm. figure things out too. Any other things for the Patriots? I don't think so. I do want to, before we wrap up uh, with the football end, we do want to mention that, Andres, you were a member of the Reading football team this year, correct? Yes. I just want to say it was a great season for the Reading Rockets. They were able to go all the way to the Super Bowl and mm -hmm. play King Philip at Gillette Stadium last Saturday. And it was a great game, no matter what yeah. anybody says. It was a game that was kind of on the edge of your seats. It was back and forth till the very last minutes yeah. of the game on figuring out who was going to win. I just want to hear your overall thoughts on how your season was and kind of what, what's the next step. Um, well, I want to just get it going. It was a good season. You know, I love the coaches, all great people. But the thing is that really you know, we struggled in is our secondary. Like our corners were a little shaky, but like, the Super Bowl is where they struggled a lot, and yeah. I just don't understand. Like, we went for the two point conversion in the beginning of the game. I think we should try to just kick the extra point. I think it would have been a different game. Mm -hmm. But, like, on the uh, statistics, we were supposed to lose 33 to nothing. Really? Yeah. That was the expectation? We were supposed to lose 33 to nothing. Yep. Yeah. And we lost 21 to like 18. 21 18 was the final score. Yeah. So, honestly, like, the coaches for Reading are, you know, they're just good. Like, they know what they're doing. Yep. And everyone thought, oh, King Phillips, bigger, faster, stronger. They're going to blow us out of the water. But, no, I think we played well. And let's hope we get them, you know, next year. Hopefully we can repeat and go to Gillette. Was it tough going into the game with a loss against Stoneham? Was that tough? Or was that forgotten? We put it behind us, honestly. Yeah. In a way, did it almost help you guys because you were probably more focused and prepared? Um, honestly, our coach, when we were you know, doing our locker room meetings and stuff, he's like, we're going to take it week by week. We're going to focus on Stoneham, and then we're going to move to King Phillip. I mean, we didn't play our best game in, uh, versus Stoneham mm -hmm. whatsoever. We got outplayed pretty much and out physical too. Right. But we came into King Phillip this uh, Super Bowl you know, practice week and we practice our best we ever have. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that now. What's it like to play on play at Gillette Stadium? It's, it's Was that like, your first experience? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I've been to the like Patriots game, but like yeah. standing on the field, it's so surreal. Yeah. Like just thinking like Tom Brady's sweat yeah. is on the Tom field. Tom Brady spit right here. <laughs> <laughs> Let me lick it up. No. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Yeah, I bet you were. No, <laughs> go. But uh, it was really cool, like, you know, like, just looking up at, like, the big Megatrons and stuff yep. and seeing, like, you know, all the people. It's just so cool. Now, this was my third, yeah, this is the third time that I was able to broadcast the game from Gillette, and I thought this experience for me was the best of the three. There was the first time where I was able to see a win. Yeah. That was the first time we, I went there. It was the second time, it was kind of like, eh. It was kind of a blowout. Yeah. Um, and then this time, I think it was because it was later. It had a different feel. Yeah. Before, it was kind of like an 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock game. This one kind of felt like it was a Friday night game, like the best of the best in a way. That's oh. how it felt to me. It was awesome. Um, so I was glad you were able to share that, that, those thoughts on and your experience with us because yeah. that's important. Um, and I do want to just make sure we say to um, all the Reading fans that are out there that it was a great season. And we hope that the Rockets get back on top for next season. Yep. Uh, it was a great season for North Reading as well for football, too. We have to give credit yeah. um, where credit is due. And, and North Reading deserves credit as well. We're going to change the gears to our Celtics and our Bruins right now. We NBA fans more or we hockey fans more? 
NBA. 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 So let's look at the Celtics here. Celtics had a crushing loss, which was Monday night against the uh, Houston Rockets. Yeah. 107, 106. And usually we like to start at the top and talk about everything that was going on from the game. Al Horford gets the ball. Final seconds left. Misses. Drives to the hoop. Misses. Kind of was a telling side of things on how the season's been for the Celtics. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the Celtics What's have up had, with the Celtics? They've had a lot of really close games. I think most of it comes down to the defensive side of things. I think, you know, last year going down the stretch, defense was a problem. I think this year it's becoming a pretty big problem too. And I think, you know, Marcus Smart has been one of my favorite players. But I think he's been overrated. You know, was he a fourth overall pick? Yeah. And he is, I mean, he's been nothing but a bench player. I mean, he's, he's had his moments. But we, if we're going to be legit contenders, we need him to step up to be our, you know, big six man. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, yeah, like I've watched some Celtics games, but like, I thought they were going to be strong. Like, I thought they were going to be, like, supposed to be right there this. with the Cavs. Yeah. Like, I was like, all right, like, this is going to be a season where, like, we go in and we could compete with the Cavs. I think we'll make the playoffs, but I don't think we're going to go far. Nope. Like, wasn't in the beginning of the year Al Horford hurt for, like, a couple weeks? And they were not very good without no. him. They're, I think their last 10 games, they were, they're 6-4, and four, yeah. I'd like to say. And they just haven't looked strong. What you see from Al Horford is a true veteran. He is a fans player. Mm-hmm. He is and a team and a team a team guy. He is all does the right thing. He is always hard working, very good with portraying himself in the best way he can. He's not a superstar. And I think when Al Horford was signed here by the Celtics, a lot of fans thought we had a superstar coming into the garden. It's not the case. You need another player that needs to go around Horford. And you don't have that. I'm sorry, you do not. I'm really glad you brought up the Marcus Smart point because he needs to be traded. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of done on Marcus Smart. And you're probably saying, what? He's young. He's just started. I don't like his mentality. Okay, He is not a Boston Celtic player. He's selfish in my opinion. He is way overrated. And I think that he belongs on a team like the Sacramento Kings. <laughs> Speaking of the Sacramento Kings, there's a team that's not doing so great right now. And they have one of the best players in the NBA, DeMarcus Cousins. Could he fit here with the Celtics? Yes, he's a nut. I get it. But can Brad Stevens make him be outstanding here? Can it work? I don't care what kind of nut he is. If we can get a player like DeMarcus Cousins... What, he averaged like in the 30s for points. He gets a ton of rebounds. He would be the perfect, a perfect fit for the Celtics. We don't have that, that, that's a problem with the Celtics this year. In the last few years, we don't have that centerpiece that we can look to, that that stud. Avery Bradley's probably been the closest this year, but Cousins would be huge for our team moving forward. Is there any other names out there? I mean, we all, I keep hearing Cousins all the time. Who's out there? Who could they get? Because let's just put it this way. By the All-Star break, this team's not going to look the same way it does right now. It's not. Danny Ainge, I think, has just about had it with building all these youth, all the youth and and all these draft picks are playing together. It's time to package the draft players together and go and get your bona fide star. You've got to do it. Who's out there? You know what? Just what you guys were saying, DeMarcus Cousins, we trade some, you know, guys we've gotten, like, smart. We trade them, like... They need younger guys, too. Yeah. If we can get a Cousins, I think we could just play just as well or not, or even not like Would the bar the be cast. raised if he's here? I think absolutely. Oh God, easily. Absolutely. And if Cousins wants to be a psychopath, basically, I think I you deal so. with it if you're going to win ball games. Now, another name that came up probably about three weeks ago, and there's a rumor with Golden State. It was yeah. about Clay Thompson. Did you guys hear about that move? Yeah. Or about that oh, right, rumor? Trade rumors. Trade rumors. It was involving Avery Bradley, Jay Crowder, a couple different other names. Put him together for Clay Thompson. I'm saying to myself, I think you do it. What do you think? I don't. I don't. don't? I, I am a, I'm a big Avery Bradley fan. He's so consistent. He's been... He's just—he's great defense. He's great offense. He's clutch. 
I don't think I don't think Clay Thompson is where we need. I think we need a big man that can score and get a lot of rebounds. I think that should be our main focus. Okay. Yeah, I think we need a big man. Yeah, Al Horford, you know, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. He's a good player. He but, reminds me of having Ray Allen without a Paul Pierce and a Kevin Garnett. That's what he reminds me. Yeah. What do you think? That Lone Ranger. Yeah, he's I, a Lone Ranger. Yeah, I, I like Horford, but he's just not that big, physical, big man that I think we need. And I, you know, I was when you know it was coming down to who who the Celtics were going to get, Durant or Horford. I would have loved to get Dwight Howard, um, but you know that chance passed. Right. Um, so I think we all are in agreement here that the Celtics need to get better for this yeah. season uh, as we see it right here. Are there any other important things that we want to talk about for the NBA? Uh, I think we're good. I think we're good. We answered um, everything. I think we're good. So one of the things we want to wrap up here on the show is I think the Bruins deserve equal time. We've given everybody else some time. So I think it's a chance for the Bruins to get their kind of story on how their season's been. It's been another one of those shaky style seasons. It's been early. It's been um, a season where we've had injuries uh, for the Bruins. Chara has been out. Um, uh, uh, Bolesky is also out. So that's that's another player that the Bruins are missing from having to score. Um, overall, my thoughts on what I think for the Bruins is I don't see them being a playoff team. They're not good enough. That's what I think. I think that they got Rask as their stud, as their goaltender. He's had a great season, but they're missing that big defenseman. Chara is almost 40 now, and they are still counting on him to be a number one. I think that's pathetic in a way. Yeah, I think the Bruins gave up their chances. I mean, we had, we've had, we had so many you know young studs come onto our team, good players, and then we get rid of them. I mean, Tyler Sagan... Mm-hmm. Phil Kessel, I, I think there was a few others. I Joe mean, Thornton. They, we we had we had chances to you know make it to the top, and we gave them up because oh they weren't you know unbelievably defense, but they you know look at Sagan and Kessel how they're doing on their teams. I mean they're they're studs. I think where I mean this is where we should be because we made bad decisions. That's Claude Julian right there. It is because I they don't fall into go. his system. He's an overrated coach. He is. Um, I totally agree. I don't, yeah. I think we should get rid of Claude Julian. Yep. I. Like the last few years, I think last year we didn't make the playoffs, and the year before we didn't either, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, we might not even make it this year either. That's I, 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 honestly, this team's worse than last year. Oh my god, easily. Yeah. Because Char is a year older. Yeah. We don't have a like that. There's stud no um, who was the who was the guy that we had? Louis Erickson. Louis Erickson was a thirty yep. goal yep. scorer last year. Yeah. You don't have that. Gave him up. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna make the playoffs. I think that. Somehow, if we do make the playoffs, we need to go out for what you said, a big defenseman to solidify, solidify this team. Now, I like Bergeron. I like Marshan, I like those guys. Yeah. Those are kind of like your core. But guys like David Krejci, who we banked on way too highly, has been very poor. Mm-hmm. And that's been one of the reasons why the Bruins haven't been able to take it to the next level. Um, Tori Krug really hasn't increased his game much. He's just an average Joe, just an average Joe out there. They need to get better. And unfortunately, because of the salary cap, they're restricted. So they really have to figure out what they're going to do. They need some of their youth to be better, and maybe they will, maybe they won't. But right now, our overall recap is it's kind of shaky with how the Bruins have been. We're going to wrap it up here on Face the Facts. For, the, uh, for you guys, any other things that you'd like to bring here to the table? Um. No, I think that is it. I think that's it. We really did cover a lot here tonight. So Hi, Mom. Yes, yeah. hi, Mom. We all love you. How are we doing? <laughs> um, Andres, I want to thank you for coming again. You did a great thank job you. tonight. Same with Ryan as well. Thank you. I want to wish you a happy holidays here for Face to Facts. We hope to be with you before all the festivities and all the good things happen before the close of the year. Um, so we will see you again very shortly. I'm Nick Face. We'll see you later. <laughs>